some places you just love. This thing's got just smog spewing out of it. It looks like it's gonna keel over. There's an old barn out here. And the awesome, it's like a cool little building, but the awesome signage. These are the things you miss out on when you, I guess, live somewhere else. Oh, the things that make your city unique and prominent as they are. This kind of reminds me of the story I'm gonna to bring to you today. Hello, everybody. It is March 24th, 2021, and I have a little go-between pathway to go down to get off this busy freaking Gleason Street. So it's March 24th, you know what that means? A new day and a new story. But before we get to that, as always, remember to like, share, subscribe, hit up my Patreon if you want to do all those little things to help my little channel grow. The link to my Patreon is in the description below, as well as the link to my Facebook and Instagram pages closely related to the content that I am producing here. And all that said, let's get to today's video. Oh, I forget when I go down here, these pooches always greet me. Want to see today's video? Well, that's silence, dumb. So it is March 24th, 1920, 101 years ago today. And this happened in the very city that I reside in, in regards to an area that I frequented numerous times in relation to my Steve the Amateur Historian channel. That being downtown Portland. Now, while the downtown area has been lauded, lauded and applauded for creating a fairly effective uh, system of streets because pretty much every street in downtown is a one-way street. So if you, you know, miss your turn, you have to go like two blocks down and then wrap back around. Two blocks down, two blocks this way, and then turn yourself around. And what is this guy doing? Sorry, I thought this guy was gonna talk to me because they stopped right in the middle of the street. And so that's a very prominent element to downtown Portland and for all of its pomp that it's received and maybe it is a fairly well structured system it's a damn nightmare to deal with and I'm sure other you know major downtown areas have followed suit in terms of how they structure their city but it is if you drive like when I first got my license way back in the day I would drive just about anywhere except downtown Portland. It was because I thought I was gonna get into a car accident. It was because the, the well, and it's not just, it's not just the drivers. It's not just that, you know, the streets are tight, you got a lot of traffic, but it's pedestrians in, in downtown Portland do not care. They do not care. They are hellions. They always have been. They will literally, they will just walk out. If, if there's, you know, if they step up to a curbstone, like this here, uh, half the time they don't even look, they just walk out in the street. There's so many pedestrians that just walk out in the street without looking. It's a very downtown Portland thing. You 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 have to be on your heels driving because you don't just have to be defensive against other drivers. You gotta be defensive against pedestrians walking up and down the street. So in all fairness, it isn't all just the other drivers, but yeah, for years, I, the, I got my license in September, 2004. And the first time that I ever drove in downtown, it was during this time in my life where I was trying to like revitalize my existence, you'll find a new identity and all that crap. And I was trying to just be more lively. And I finally decided to go into downtown and go to Powell's Books and a Friend. That was June, 2010. So I'd had my license for nearly six years before I finally took on the demon that was downtown Portland and it's one way streets. So that, that's a prominent thing. It's almost as prominent as the buildings there. And the identity of the area is the fact that it's, you know, pretty much all one-way streets. Well, today's story from this day back in 1920 is majorly prevalent to that taking effect. And maybe when all is said and done, it was a good idea to do. And I'm trying not to just knock it all together. I'm just saying it's, it's still kind of dangerous out there, but maybe it's a lot less dangerous than it was back in the day. And 
So this, this big commission got together. 256 members to, to, you know, vote essentially on whether we should look into establishing a one-way street system in downtown. At this point, that didn't exist. 246 of the 256 members uh, said, I, and so that really began this major push against the city government to start implementing a one-way street system in downtown Portland. So this is really, this is some of the, the humble beginnings of what is now such a major thing in this city. And you know, just a second ago, I was talking about how, you know, maybe it was a lot more dangerous back then. And I've been watching some older movies with my girlfriend recently, and uh, we watched The Magnificent Amber since the other night, which I'm not gonna get too far down the road with that, but one of the characters is an Orson Welles movie from, I believe, 1942, and hell yeah, brother. And Joseph Cotton, who was a pretty well-known actor at the time, he was friends with Orson Welles. Uh, you know, the film takes place around the turn of the century, and he's this guy, Joseph Cotton, who's gotten involved in the establishment of, you know, it's the early years of trying to establish uh, automobiles as a viable method of travel and like you see his first car and like it can barely move. You have to crank it for like 10 minutes to get the motor to go. And then by the end of the movie, it's like Model T's. So you see the progression. And so that got me and my girlfriend talking about, well, you know, what, I wonder, you know, what, what was the, you know, how dangerous were, you know, old cars back in the day? They had to be dangerous. You know, because they didn't have the safety features. They didn't really have seat belts. You know, there weren't really doors. You just kind of hopped in. Like there was, and you know, obviously the cars weren't built to take on what they're, these are the early days of automobiles. So like we, we got into this big conversation about, I wonder how, how dangerous it was, you know, really to drive back then beyond what you like already know. You know, like, yeah, the roads were all bumpy and rutted and, you know, you were driving these Model T cars that had, you know, little wood wheels that could just snap. The axles could just crack if they hit, you know, a boulder that was sticking up a little bit. Like, we know that stuff, but it's funny because, like, this is last night we were having this discussion and I noted in this article that they expressed, like, you know, the city of Portland today, there's, you know, an accident you know, there's a few accidents a day, but there's also a substantially higher population in the city now than there was in 1920. I mean, it's not even close. They said in this article that in the prior year, the city of Portland had experienced 770 car accidents, 126 of which happened in downtown Portland. Correction, there was 770. I saw that number and I thought that has to be over a year. It's 1920. 770 car accidents in a month. A month, I thought it was a year. I literally read the article and saw a month. And my head was like, no, that can't be true. And my mind told myself it said a year. 770 car accidents in a month. That's... Math was never my strong suit. But seriously, that is how many car accidents a day? Uh, that's like more than 20 a day. Sorry, I'm just, I'm doing random math off the top of my head and I've already been vlogging for hours. So, I mean, by 1920, there was just a little over a quarter of a million people in Portland. And now, the, I mean, population a hundred years later is more than double that. It's, we're pushing 700,000 people. So really, you know, a couple more years down the road, there's gonna be like three times that many people. And I'm about to get mowed down here. So my apologies if I have to swift shuffle quickly. There we go. So yeah, to think that the population was that much smaller and yet, 770 accidents in one year, but it does harken back to that idea that, I mean, yeah, of course, cars. It's still the very early days of automobiles. 
1920. But to think, oh, and that, that's another thing. It's like, it's not like just because there was 254, 200, oh no, I think it's, I think it's like 258,000 people in 1920 lived in Portland. It's not like that meant there was, you know, a little more than a quarter of a million cars on the road. Uh, a lot fewer people had cars in those earlier days compared to how many people have cars in this city now. I mean, it's not, I mean, look at this road. I can barely navigate myself down this road because I'm just literally, I'm completely like, I'm just, I'm surrounded. I mean, look, I'm surrounded by autos. That wasn't quite the case in 1920. So that makes that 770 figure even more remarkable. And it got me thinking, oh, maybe, maybe it was a good idea that they altered the uh, setup of the downtown streets. And of course, downtown was still the most heavily traveled area. So it was understood that they would push a one-way system there, but not necessarily other parts of Portland where, you know, they were more residential and not as much traffic. Speaking of traffic, it's getting freaking loud over here. And apparently an effort to establish uh, this one-way system had been voted down earlier. And that was followed up by this uh, reported increase in auto accidents, which of course, those that by 1920 were pushing for this one-way system again, were like, look what happened. You guys voted it down and we're having more traffic accidents. It's hard to say for absolute certain that that was the reason, uh, cause people drove like hellions. Have you ever seen video from like the twenties and the thirties of the way people drove? Like they, they were, they were crazy. They were fearless. But, the devil, this is all fenced off, but there's just a chair sitting in there. I don't know what that means. Sorry, that distracted me. <laughs> but, yeah, so it seemed like there was finally the acknowledgement we can't push back on this any longer, and we have that system today. Uh, the latter portion of the article kind of strayed away from the whole one way argument and it was more call because I just thought this was interesting you know maybe it was just the vibes of the day but they called out uh, I guess patrol officers officers walking their beats the officers dealing with lunatics like this guy nobody likes you sorry when people drive like that I gotta yell at them uh, but I, th I thought this was very interesting that they were they were calling out like patrol officer a any officer that would be responsible for dealing with a traffic violation and they were called out because apparently they were you know if someone was speeding which of course it's a very common cause for car accidents is driving speeding around like an idiot uh, apparently the uh, Officers that spent their time doing that were taken to task. Like, uh, clearly there was so much chaos going on on the streets that they didn't want anybody wasting their time chasing people that were speeding down the street. So that literally they advised them like, don't be chasing people around. That's a waste of time. So focus more of your attention on people that are cutting corners and you know, jumping the curbs. People that are, they said jockeying on bridges, which I, I, when I hear that, I'm guessing people that were like, kind of like weaving around up on bridges. I, I don't know exactly what that term would mean in 1920, but I think of jockeying, I think of the term like jockeying for position, which is like trying to get yourself in position to get around somebody. It's like a popular like basketball term, like when you're trying to get a rebound, jockeying for position, that's the vibe I get. So you're supposed to focus on literally what they acknowledge in the newspaper as more minor violations. But no, the guys that are speeding around the city and plowing into people and driving like reckless lunatics, don't worry about them. They're not a problem. And it's a waste of time to chase them anyway. Like my God, oh, the way the system used to be. So, you know, not the, not the craziest story in the world, but sometimes the intrigue of a story is just about finding something 
buried deep in our past, buried in all these old newspapers that a lot of people haven't gandered at and looked through in a really long time. And you find these initial moments that built toward things that are of great prominence today that, you know, that they're so, uh, especially if you live in downtown Portland, you gotta go through downtown Portland, which is pretty much anybody who lives in Portland at some point or another. And, you know, it, it's things like that. The, the one-way system we have on the streets in downtown Portland, it's something that's so, it's so a reality. It's, it's such an everyday thing that you have to deal with in that area that people don't even really think about it because it's just, it's such a, it's an everyday occurrence that you have to encounter and deal with. People don't even really think about how prominent that one little element of life in Portland is to people. And so little pieces like this, these articles that finally that discuss, you know, the first real push after its failure, there was this push to get this system going and to protect people on the streets. And as crazy as drivers and pedestrians are in this city, it seems like probably in the end, you know, my, my somewhat negative perspective towards the one-way system has been a little bit altered by reading this article, which shows that clearly things were worse before this system was implemented. So literally my hat's off to you, earlier days of Portland. Man, my hair's flat as all hell. But anyway, that is the story of how a little piece of Portland became what it is today from what it was before. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Remember as always to like, share, subscribe, hit up my Patreon, do all those little things to help my little channel grow and blossom like a flower in springtime. The link to my Patreon, as well as my Instagram and Facebook pages is in the description below. And you know, all that content is closely related to the content that are those pages are closely related to the content that I'm doing here as well as the content I'm doing on my main channel, Steve the Amateur Historian. Whew. And all that said, thank you again one more time from the heart for watching. This is Steve, and I'll see you tomorrow.